past 10 now and um, we've got a number of people in the room. No one else seems to be joining us at the moment. So I think we should make a start. It would be great for me if you can just confirm that you can actually hear me. Um, that would be good. Otherwise, you always feel like you're speaking into a void and someone can unmute themselves and maybe just say that uh, that you can hear. Yeah, can hear you, Elliot. Great, thanks very much. Okay, so well, welcome um, to our second uh, series in our webinars for 2021. Um, for those of you who were here before, we had spoken about remote sensing and its uses in the water industry. Um, and today we're going to sort of go to the opposite extreme. Um, we're going to look at the microscopic uh, work that uh, we do and its macroscopic um, uses in, in projects. So, um, Nicola, can you maybe just move on to the next slide for me? Great. So, uh, your host uh, this morning is myself. So, I'm Elliot Taylor. I'm the Divisional Director for APEM's office in Ireland. Uh, we opened an office here in September last year, so we've been going about eight months now. Um, and one of the services that APEM offers is um, biolabs. So we thought we'd talk a bit about the kind of work that can be done uh, in the biolabs um, and how it's useful in, the, in a project setting. So the, the presentation will be made this morning by my colleague, uh, Nicola Penisi, who is our marine laboratory manager, but he's gonna cover freshwater and marine. We move to the next slide, thanks Nick. So just a brief introduction to, to APEM, we're a, a global environmental consulting firm um, providing independent advice and guidance to support government and environmental guidelines. Um, we have a range of services, as I've referred to, water, renewables, and marine and ports, our biolabs that we'll talk about this morning, construction, transport, power and utilities. Nick, can you move on? Yeah, so we, we, we cover from, from source to sea, um, from the upland water areas right down into the marine environment. Um, in Ireland, we're working a lot in uh, offshore wind, uh, for example, at that end of the, of the spectrum. The next slide, please, Nick. Um, yeah, so we have, we're mainly a UK-based uh, company, although we have offices um, and we're working in the US, in Australia, Vietnam, um, most recently, uh, we've opened the office here in Ireland, in, as I said, in September last year. Um, and uh, we're, we're growing that office here. We have already uh, two people working in the marine uh, field, and we hope to be adding to that in the freshwater and terrestrial fields in the, in the short future. So I think that's uh, it for the introduction. So what I'll do now is I'll hand over to, to my colleague, Nick, who will talk to you about uh, the microscopic uh, and its use for macroscopic projects. So over to you. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for your introduction, Elliot. Thank you uh, all for joining us today on this uh, webinar. We're going to explore and uh, see what is the lab work we perform at ABEM. Um, I'd like to start with a brief introduction on uh, the structures of our biolabs. Uh, we basically have three uh, branches or sections of our uh, biolabs that um, have a particular expertise, a specific expertise each. We have the phytoplankton laboratory, the freshwater invertebrates laboratory, and the marine laboratory. Although these may seem um, distinct, entities and we perform slightly different type of analysis. At the end, we all work in conjunction, we all work together and the um, areas of expertise and the type of analysis often overlap. Uh, think about the phytoplankton, for example, that can be found on any kind of water bodies from uh, river, lakes and marine, of course. And the uh, marine invertebrates, the freshwater invertebrates, sorry, um, have a kind of a grade zone, which is the brackish and estuarine waters or the lagoons or um, some salt marsh. So uh, again, our expertise is shared 
uh, we do any type of analysis on the labs, although we are our own expertise. Um, geographically, our lab are distributed all uh, over the UK. We have uh, for the labs three main locations. The phytoplankton laboratory is entirely based in Stockport uh, with my colleague Richard Bassett as a lab manager, although some of the phytoplankton analysis is performed in the marine laboratory in uh, Lechwood, uh, which is where I work um, daily. And then the freshwater invertebrates uh, laboratories. Uh, we have two labs at the moment. One is based in Stockport, again, with Richard Bassett uh, as a lab manager. The other one in Edinburgh with my colleague Sally Donaldson um, to oversee the lab. We are probably the largest, uh, all combined, the largest lab in Europe to perform this type of analysis. And our uh, experience, if we sum all the years of experience of each of us uh, adds up to more than 160 years altogether. Um, but although we are based uh, in uh, the United Kingdom, our expertise is uh, quite global. As you can see from this map, every uh, yellow star is uh, an area, a sea or land area that we have received samples from. Sometimes a single sample, sometimes a few specimens for identification, verification, sometimes quite a large project like a recent um, mid-Atlantic deep water uh, project that uh, consists of more than 230 samples from about 15 to 20 hundred meters deep. Um, it, it's going to be it's going to take too long to um, mention all the location. There's a few that are found in my memories like samples from around St. Helena Highlands um, or the Falkland Islands, the South Sandwich Islands, uh, also the Forest Pond, um, Forest Shetland Sponge Belt, which may not sound that exotic, but believe me, they're very interesting. They were very interesting samples. And then of course, the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean samples, but I'm a little biased on that um, coming from the Med myself. Um, okay. So if we can move on, uh, let's see what we're going to explore today in slightly more detail. So I'd like to introduce to you today what we do in the uh, biolabs at APEM, which is mostly summarizable as identification or any kind of biota to uh, family or species level, depends on the project requirements and on the uh, specific um, means a goal of the of the analysis itself. Uh, but also we're gonna see why we do this analysis. So how and for what scopes we produce this data, um, which can be for support or uh, um, the monitoring of, of a water body or entire uh, of a baseline assessment, uh, et cetera. And we also see how we uh, conduct this analysis, at least in, on, a, on a very uh, superficial level. Um, we're going to see how our phytoplankton lab work on the um, UCAS accredited method for 17025 international standard. We're going to see how my colleagues in the freshwater labs who all held a natural history museum freshwater macroinvertebrate species identification qualification works on the samples and uh, how our marine lab uh, operate, uh, which uh, our marine lab is also an appointed administrator for the North Atlantic uh, Marine Biological Analysis Quality Control Scheme, for which we held the um, administration for the in marine invertebrates, uh, fish components, and particle size analysis component. The what, why, and how, they're probably not going to be in this order all over the presentation. I'm sorry. Okay, so let's start with uh, phytoplankton. Um, phytoplankton uh, is the base of uh, the aquatic food web. I like to refer to it as the center of the food web uh, in, in, the, uh, in the aquatic environment. Um, they uh, are 
they produce most of the oxygen we uh, we breathe and also produce uh, uh, that primary producer that produces most of the nutrient that then other species will eat up to the food chain finishing with with, with us um we uh, there are different groups of phytoplankton. Um, the main groups are the dinoflagellates, which possess a little bit of a mobility, the cyanobacteria, also known as Brooklyn algae, and the uh, diatoms, or Bacillaria officiae. And most of them are buoyant, of course, so they float on the uh, top layers of the um, water's um, surface. Um, some of them, like the items, live more in close contact to the um, water body bottoms to the sediment. Uh, we uh, refer to this kind of organism as uh, benthic or bentonic. Um, they require inorganic nutrients in order to grow their cells and to reproduce, and uh, they convert, of course, uh, the sunlight and CO2 in oxygen as part of the process. Um, any changes in the uh, environment has a really high impact on the uh, phytoplankton because they're extremely sensitive of changes in nutrients, um, pH, um, and, and, and other physical chemical characteristics. Okay, um, in this slide, you can see on the background a, um, I'll say, typical. Uh, phytoplankton sample and contrast phase. Um, this is probably from a ballast water sample. Um, but then in the two hexagons, you see um, two examples of the main groups of and, and the main analysis we perform on phytoplankton. So on the right on the right um, hand side is, um, is a, a species of pedestrian. Um, which is a green freshwater um, phytoplankton um, species genus and each of these is a single um, cell and they form uh, this um, nice to, to see um, colonies with, with um, particular shapes and process numbers. Um, on the other side of the slide uh, here we see an uh, um, Diplonase littoralis, also known as Navicola littoralis. There's a little, still a little um, indecision on, on the full classification of this, but this is a diatom. And uh, I think we can start looking at diatoms in more details now. So what are diatoms? Diatoms are unicellular algae, and uh, they are the peculiarity of being enclosed in a silica-based cell wall, the first tool, uh, which is much harder than any other um, algae or plant cell wall. Um, they belong to the class of Bacillary Fissier and uh, have a size range that, can of, that goes from 2 to 500 microns. Uh, microns. Uh, 500 microns is 0 0.5 millimeter. I need to keep reminding this to myself. Uh, they're extremely important in the environment. They are um, the, uh, uh, one of the best source of oxygen production. It is estimated that the diatoms themselves produce up to 50% of the entire global oxygen. So half of the hair we, we break daily comes from uh, diatoms. Um, they also process silicon to incorporate in the silica base uh, shell and is estimated they can process up to 6.7 billion metric tons of uh, silicon per year. And then the first tool, the dead um, silica shell of the diatoms can be found up to half a mile down on the ocean floor. Um, as most organisms, they can reproduce, as most unicellular organisms, they can reproduce by uh, binary uh, fission. But these, um, as a downside, or should I say a downside. Uh, in fact, in each uh, reproduction stage, the uh, average size of the population decreases. Um, why this? Uh, the first tool is not a symmetrical structure, it is uh, formed by two um, alf um, that we call valves. And 
they are, uh, one of the valves is lighter and smaller than the other. So when the mother cell divide, each daughter cell inherit one of the two valves. And they always, uh, they need to create the second half and they always create the smaller half. So each uh, reproduction stage will generate a normal size, let's say normal size cell and a smaller reproduction size. And this can go on up to the point that they reach a smaller uh, limit um, in, in, in the size range for the species. At that point, another type of reproduction uh, keep, kicks in. They form a structure called oxospore, which is um, surrounded by uh, perizonia. Um, perizonia is still silica based, but it's not a uh, hard test. They're more of uh, in the shape of bands, so the cell can keep growing and increasing in size up to when they reach uh, the uh, maximum uh, size range for the species. And at that point, the uh, binary fission reproduction will start again. Okay. So in our uh, phytoplankton labs, we process an excess of 2000 samples per year on average, including the, the really weird 2020. Uh, uh, from all around the globe, uh, when I mentioned the 230 samples from, from the mid-Atlantic, there was the benthic side, but it also, we also had about 100, 150 uh, phytoplankton samples from there. Um, in order to process the um, diatoms, uh, to um, improve identification, uh, we uh, digest the sample in a hot bath of hydrogen peroxide, about 90 degrees Celsius, in order to remove everything that we don't need for identification. So, so we remove chloroplast, cytoplasm, everything else but the first two. Um, so uh, then, after the uh, digestion, we use a centrifuge to separate the digested material from frustule, and we proceed with identification of all the frustules um, on permanent slides, uh, identification and enumeration, of course. At that point, uh, the frustule has probably been divided in uh, bulbs, so we're going to identify the single bulbs. Um, what kind of information we can understand from uh, diatom uh, samples? Well, the diatoms, as all the phytoplankton, are very sensitive to changes in environment, as already said. In particular, they are um, very sensitive to uh, increase of, of variation of inorganic nutrient uh, concentration in, in, in the water. Um, each, um, we use the Trophic diatom index to um, assess um, the level of nutrients in the water. Uh, basically, each um, species have an assigned score against this um, sensitivity to the change in uh, in the concentration of nutrients, and then we weight this um, score um, all over the sample based on uh, the abundance of the particular species or, or, or group. Uh, this way we can calculate the trophy diatom index. The higher in the in is the index, the higher is the um, anorganic nutrients concentration in the water. And this can be for any kind of reason. It can be uh, um, for any kind of discharge, pollution incident, uh, runoff from an, an agricultural land, uh, wastewater discharge, uh, any uh, type of event that we input into water, more nutrients that are naturally, uh, that naturally occurs. Um, Diatoms are also very sensitive to change in the pH, uh, so the, uh, they, are, they are good um, gauge to check the acidification of waters. And in this case, we apply the same similar method, but uh, using um, the acidification sensitivity to score them. Um, and we calculate another index called diatomic acidification matrix. Metric. Um, Sorry. 
so um, we can also um, we we also able to um, by collecting paleo cores of sediment of um, gather information about historic condition because the diatom fruit soil is, is very good on, on uh, fossilization and it's very resistant and therefore we can gather information to an historic condition up to hundreds and thousand years ago. The other side of the phytoplankton analysis is to analyze the entire sample. So if you remember the, the slide I showed you earlier, the, the slide, the yellow one, that entire sample was uh, both diatoms and other type of phytoplankton. In order to do so, we cannot proceed with the digestion, otherwise we know uh, any other cell but the diatoms will be dissolved. So uh, we need to use a slightly different approach. Um, the first thing we do is uh, the homogenization of uh, the sample. Um, it's a fancy word to say that we try to distribute any phytoplankton cell across the sample evenly uh, as much as possible. And this is performed by a particular set of movement on, on the sample uh, bottle itself. Um, once has been homogenized, it been the sample been transferred to sediment chambers, which are this chamber you see in uh, uh, on the slide, um, where and they are allowed to rest in order for the phytoplankton to settle down um, on the bottom of the chamber. So the sample are then transferred to an inverted microscope, where we um, where we identified and enumerate. Um, the organisms. Um, sometimes, especially for freshwater sample, we also perform measurement of the cells in order to calculate the biovolume of the uh, lantern. So why we perform this kind of analysis? Well, of course, the phytoplankton studies are indispensable to the water frame directive and calculation of ecological, or ecological quality ratio. Um, but uh, we can also use um, this type of analysis to uh, identify any kind of toxic nuisance in the marine environment, uh, but uh, also to manage the algal blooms that can occur in, in water reservoir or lakes. Um, we also uh, are very active on the ballast water front. We um, regularly analyze um, ballast water samples in order to spot any non-native or invasive species that can um, come to the UK or to um, the, the area from where the sample come from. Um, and so stop the spread or at least monitoring uh, the condition of the uh, new introduced species. Um, it is also a uh, service quite request for lake and reservoir management because of the algal blooms most of the time and open water and swimming uh, leisure activities as well for the same reason and, and basically everything under the bathing water directive uh, of 2006. Um, the algal bloom is a particular um, important topic because it becomes an increasing problem at least across the UK. Um, basically any change in condition, nutrients, acidification, sunlight, exposure, temperature, uh, can spark an excess uh, growth in the population of the phytoplankton, in particular of the cyanobacteria. Now cyanobacteria produce a toxin called cyanotoxin that can be uh, really dangerous to the wildlife, uh, to other invertebrates, to fish or even to small mammals, also to the human beings in, in the worst case scenario. Um, so it's something you need to be um, monitored constantly um, and managed. Symptoms of the um, cyanotoxin um, poison can be various from a simple skin rash to a severe uh, liver disease. Okay, um, these are some examples of a few, a really few species of oh, genus of phytoplankton we can find in our sample, uh, in our sample. So uh, on the top left, we have a representative of the genus Anabena. Anabena are um, 
estrogen brackish water species they can produce toxins and they are they form this kind of a pier necklace um, look like uh, colonies on the bottom left we have a representative of a uh, colonial diatom uh, from the genus Ketoceros with this very very nice um, shape of the colony and and production from the from the first two we have a representative of a green uh, algae on the bottom right corner in Cosmarion sp and then probably my favorite on the top right corner is what is called cispark uh, scientific name noctiloca scintillans which is a bioluminescent phytoplankton responsible for some of the beautiful fascinating photos you've seen all over the news and social media of the blue sparkling water in the night all over the globe. The uh, Freshwater Laboratory um, is another a strong branch of our company. We process about 1600 samples per year on average, again, including 2020, which was an anomalous year for reasons that we all know. Our method is based on the Environment Agency Standard Method, the Freshwater Microinvertebrate Analysis or River and Sample from 2014. Uh, this means that all our samples are sieved over a 0.5 millimeter mesh. Um, samples are collected from river and lakes, uh, sometimes using small graphs, more often using the standard approach of the three minute kicks and hand search for various habitats, um, all the possible habitat present. Transfer to the lab, they, they have a very fast turnaround for analysis as the method uh, imposes and uh, the most identified to family level because of the water framework directive uh, metrics that we, we need to calculate. We can take them to species, we often do this uh, regardless of the um, requirement, uh, especially if we need to look for uh, invasive or non-native. Um, and so uh, they're used to calculate the ecological equality uh, ratio that uh, as five classes from high, which is an understood ideal environment, uh, to good, moderate, poor, and finally bad condition, the condition we don't want to reach ever. We, uh, there's more or less for five or seven classes and then hundreds of species of uh, freshwater invertebrates in uh, uh, the samples we uh, routinely analyze. And each uh, taxon has different uh, ecological requirements and tolerance to changes in the environmental condition. Um, so we tend to divide them in uh, um, uh, three uh, main uh, group. They are um, tolerant, intermediate and sensitive. Uh, sensitive are the species that are don't like at all changes in condition. Um, and the EQR is mostly based on this uh, mm, Diagram, which is an historical um, diagram from Heinz 1960, the biology of polluted waters. Uh, it's look may look complicated, but it's quite simple to interpret. Basically, um, these two um, halves show the same river from a physical chemical point of view and a biological point of view. Um, this outfall is the pollution event we will take in consideration. Everything on the left-hand side are ideal conditions. So we see from a physical chemical point of view before the outfall, we have high level of oxygen at very low levels of suspended sediment, uh, salt and uh, biological oxygen demand. Um, on a biological point of view, we have high level of extremely sensitive species uh, that want and, and, and live in clean waters and very low level of any other species, either intermediate or tolerant. Once an outfall event happens, we see a drop in the oxygen level and a sudden spark in the uh, biological oxygen demand and suspended solids and, and uh, other nutrient distribution. Um, on the biological side, contemporary, we'll see there's a drastic drop in the uh, sensitive species um, abundance distribution up to the point that they can disappear and an increase on the um, tolerant or intermediate species. 
a little bit like the diatom trophic index, we assign to each um, relevant tax, uh, uh, taxon a score based on their sensitivity or tolerance. And we um, also consider the uh, number of scoring taxa all across the sample. And by interaction of these two numbers, we calculate um, an index that then is translated um, uh, in the uh, I um, good moderate levels that we've seen earlier. Um, we also keep an eye always on the invasive and non-native species because it's, uh, it's imperative that they be um, monitored closely uh, to avoid any incontrollable uh, spread. Um, some example of all these groups, uh, the stonefly larvae are um, a good example of pollution sensitive organisms, um, particularly Brachyptera putata is an example of this much more. While the pollution tolerance can be the larvae of the cephidae or flower flies, other flies, and their particular shape for which they call uh, rat tail maggots. Um, what to mention among the um, invasive species, the quagga mussel can be a big nuisance for um, a lot of reasons, including the uh, man-made structure that can be um, clogged by them. Uh, and also what made the news a few years ago, the demon and killer shrimp. Um, these uh, two organisms are both belonging to the Dicarogamorous uh, genus, and uh, they are extremely voracious predators. Actually, sometimes they don't kill even to feed themselves, just to um, take the territory or maintain their territory. Uh, and, and they can kill everything in the, in the water body from other invertebrates to small fish. Um, so they can be extremely harmful for the native species. And to distinguish between them, it's quite hard. And as usual, the devil is in the details. So uh, the difference between the two species at the end, uh, it's just the number of spine on the uh, eurosome segments, whether there's two, three or more. And now we can come to the uh, marine laboratory. Uh, as, as I already said, we are probably the largest uh, marine laboratory in Europe performing uh, benthic analysis. Our samples and our analysis include not just the benthos though, and not just the invertebrates. Um, we work on meiofauna samples, zooplankton, we process marine phytoplankton samples, we identify uh, fish from the egg stage to the larva stage to the adults. And we also uh, do analysis of macroalgae. Um, when a sample comes to the marine lab, everything in the sample uh, will be analyzed. We are the uh, contractors for the uh, NMBAQC scheme for the invertebrates, the fish component, but also for the particle size analysis. Um, we work for all the major agencies, uh, environment agencies, both in uh, England, Scotland, Wales, uh, Northern Ireland. Um, so most of the regulatory authorities, conservation agencies, but as well for construction companies, uh, water companies, power companies. Um, big part of our job is related to wind farm energy or offshore uh, oil and gas extraction, but also aggregates. And we also um, do analysis for other consultancy companies. Um, collecting samples from the marine environment is slightly more complicated than uh, the freshwater mostly because of some of the depth we need to reach. So uh, we do um, quite a lot of intertidal sample, um, both for phase one and two. Uh, phase two involves collection of sample for further investigation. And this is made by the insertion of a, a core sampler in the sediment in order to collect a specific volume of this sediment to be analyzed in the lab. 
everything subtitle needs to be taken using a uh, drop down video onto a video for which we perform analysis as well. But most of our sample, of course, are physical and they're taken by devices called grabs. Uh, these are three examples of the the main example of grabs we, we, we use uh, in our service. Um, uh, this is a day grab that is mostly used to collect samples from uh, muddy, silty environments uh, up to a certain depth, of course. Then after that depth, we need to start using um, subtitle course systems. Um, they, for example, the, the day grab is, very, is used often for samples from the, from the Thames, which is a very particular environment. Um, when the... Um, particle size increase a little bit, so we pass to uh, fine to coarse sand, uh, it's better to use a van bin grab. And finally, when the, um, the sediment size is mixed or large, like a gravel, cobbles, or any other kind of large um, type of sediment, uh, the hammond grab is the best device. Although we use a mini hammond grab uh, to, um, in order to have a comparable size, to the, uh, to the day grab here. Um, once the samples are collected, they've been saving, saved on board to the required uh, mesh size that is either 0.5 over a millimeter uh, or 500 microns or one millimeter, uh, preserved in fixed in formalin uh, before being preserved in, in uh, IMS uh, back in the lab and transfer them to the lab for analysis. In the laboratory, then we proceed with extraction of the, uh, all the biota, uh, both fauna and flora, and identification on the microscope. Um, we analyze an excess of 2,500 uh, sample per year on average, and this is just to include microbendic and zooplankton. So I'm not considering this count any phytoplankton or analysis or video analysis. Um, the proportion is um, about 1,500 microbendic and 500 each zooplankton and ballast water um, samples. But for ballast water sample, we do uh, both phytoplankton, uh, phytoplankton and zooplankton uh, analysis, um, mostly for um, early detection of any potential invasive or non-native species. Um, our method is mostly based on the NMBAQC guidelines that incidentally have been written by two APM senior staff more than 20 years ago. And they are uh, up to date the standard for the British industry and well, I'll say Northern Europe industry. Um, but also uh, some of our procedures, especially on the quality control, are reflecting uh, the uh, International Standardization Organization method, uh, ISO 16665, um, latest update of 2014, which is called Guidelines for Quantitative uh, Sampling and Sample Processing of Marine Soft Bottom Microfauna. Um, some of the details uh, that we need to identify uh, our uh, biota uh, require uh, move the sample to high power microscopes uh, with higher magnification than the uh, compared to the up uh, to the dissection microscope you see here. This is because, uh, uh, contrary to the freshwater and the um, diatom uh, phytoplankton analysis. Um, they are not, uh, we don't use indexes most, we use statistical analysis mostly based on biodiversity. So we need to know as better, as best as we can, uh, how many different taxa are present in our samples and their relative abundance. So we need to take the identification to the lowest taxonomic level possible. And uh, therefore we need high magnification uh, microscope. We will see uh, later some details of this kind of, of analysis. As the uh, 
good laboratory practices dictate, we held a reference collection. Our reference collection wall is quite extensive. Uh, we uh, currently have an excess of 7,400 single entries in our reference collection. And this can be used for any kind of uh, reason. It's just a um, historical record of the project we have worked on, but also it is uh, uh, very helpful in identification of difficult uh, taxa. And often we uh, borrow, uh, we lend our um, a specimen, genus of families depends the request to international experts that are working on expanding uh, the uh, knowledge on that particular group. Um, we also held an extensive literature, especially uh, related to the uh, foreign samples that we, the overseas samples that we analyze. Um, oh, almost forgot. Um, I'd like to uh, point out also uh, this structure on top of our dissection microscope. This is a microscope camera that um, was used to take in this photo and all the other photos you see through this presentation. All the photos in this presentation are open, uh, made by us, by a technique which is called stacking. We need to take um, photo at different uh, magnification and a different focus. And then with a particular use of software and uh, human skills, we stack them all together to form almost a tridimensional um, uh, photos. And these photos can, uh, part of our service, the, we can offer um, photographic reference collection to our client. It can be used for just cosmetic of the reports, as well as marketing purpose, as you've seen if you have a look on our social media. Uh, or as we do in the lab, it's just nice to see hanged around the walls. Um, so, what we can see in a marine sample. Um, uh, this is a typical microscope where we have our petri dish from which we extract the smallest uh, part of the biota. The largest part is extract in trays, especially because in the marine environment, the um, organisms tend to grow on each other, especially the, the uh, epibentic. So it's in it's a certain level of uh, experience to separate them uh, in a trace, then transfer them on a microscope for further sorting. Uh, the four major taxonomic group that can be found in marine environments are um, shown in this slide. There are polychids, crustaceans, mollusks, and echinoderms. There's a fifth group that includes everything else, in fact, it's called other, so miscellanea, and includes any other kind of non-bristol worms, such nematians, uh, nematodes, flatworms, but also any other kind of arthropod which is not a crustacean, for example, insects or uh, arachnidae or sea spiders, which is our uh, own group. And um, by the analysis of the combination and, and, and the biodiversity uh, of this species, we are able to understand the biotope of that specific area and build up uh, biotope uh, maps of the seafloor or the shore. Uh, the one of the main group, yeah, polychids and crustaceans are the main groups we found. Polychids are probably have more than 8,000 species um, all over the world, while crustaceans have even more, uh, about 65,000, more or less. Uh, mollusks are also widespread with about 85,000 uh, species all over the world, and finally the um, echinoderms. Um, these um, this eye support comes from the ferrospongial seed belt. It's quite, let's see if we can expand it a little bit. There we are. So this is Toya and an eye support. Eye support are living mostly in uh, aquatic environment, but we, um, we can find some example of eye support uh, terrestrial, the, the um, uh, understones, uh, at pigs, I think it's called that you see in your garden. Uh, and they are the only group of terrestrial crustaceans, the isopod. Um, 
polychaetes are cosmopolitan, you can find them everywhere. Um, this Nerimia punctata is belonged to the family of Esionid, and it was the first Esionid ever identified back in 1776 by Mueller. Um, this bivalve, Tiora lubrica, is a non-native species that we recently found in Lovesoft in England. Uh, this is a photo from our paper uh, from the description. Um, sorry for the when we found the first um, specimen in the UK. Uh, it's native of the um, West Pacific around the uh, Sea of Japan and I moved then from uh, Japan to New Zealand to the US, arrived on the uh, European coast of Netherlands uh, some time ago and it is now um, recorded in Britain as well. And finally, this is a representative of a sea cucumber from a deep sample in the mid-Atlantic. It's probably an undescribed species belonging to the genus Molpedia that I'm currently investigating. Um, these are some more examples of polychaetes. As I said, they are ubiquitous and they have a lot of different families, species, um, and of course, shapes and um, habitat and, and behaviors. Um, Again, these are just few examples of worms that I like a little more than others, but for no particular reason. Um, Spirobranchus together is a representative of serpolid family. The serpolids have this uh, characteristic of being bicostructure. They build calcareous tubes, they can form a structure called trottoirs in, uh, that you can see in the Mediterranean, so it's a large bicostructions. Um, Largest coreni is a representative of the pectinarid groups, the family, sorry, uh, also known as um, ice cone tube worms or trumpet tube worms because of the shape uh, of the tubes they construct and the characteristic of this golden kitty or around the oral area called uh, pali. Um, this one is a representative of the polynoids, also known as scale worms, and they modified some of the bristle or kitty in scales that they use for camouflage and protection purpose. They are uh, mostly active predators, although they tend to stay hidden um, to avoid to be um, predate themselves, and they can be found living in symbiosis with other uh, tube-dwelling or borrowing organisms. And finally, uh, this rather ugly uh, worm is a representative of Sternapsidae, um, which is recently been uh, um, reviewed as a family, and uh, this genus was considered to be cosmopolitan, but of course, as every cosmopolitan species, they probably not. In fact, uh, much more species have been described recently, and uh, they are very difficult to identify the um, details um, to be a look at the um, caudal shields here. They live borrowed in soft sediment, and they use this shield to uh, close the burrow, and uh, when they need to breed and feed, they um, exit from the borough from uh, with, with the gills and the tentacles from this area, which is not the head. This is actually the tail or anal hand. The uh, head of the worm is here and it can be entirely retracted um, inside the uh, the body. This structure is called introvert, can be entirely retracted so they become even more uh, protected from uh, predation and disturbance. Some example of crustaceans with uh, representative of the main groups we can find in our sample. Uh, this is a comesha, Campylapsis orida. They also call coma, coma shrimps because of their shape with this enlarged body and um, kind of uh, thin tail. Um, this is a representative of a, a tiny insides group, tanades, uh, so there's laterally, they can be found in any kind of environment from intertidal to very deep. Uh, see. Um, amphipods with Dexamine spinosa as an example are probably the most abundant um, 
crustacean we found in benthic samples. We will see shortly where we can find it in plankton samples. And finally, a representative of a slightly more evolved crustacean uh, belonging to the known group, uh, uh, group known as uh, mantis shrimp. This is a representative of species uh, you can find in Britain, Rhizoides desmoresti, but in the Mediterranean, um, the most diffuse one is Squilla mantis, which is also uh, commercially important as edible species. Um, in the zooplankton samples, the most abundant uh, group at all uh, is the copepods, which again belongs to the crustacean. They're very small, and they're ubiquitous, and someone considered them to be uh, the largest animal biomass on Earth. Some had argued they are euphacids, so there's a little bit of a debate, and as you can imagine, it's not easy to um, solve this dispute. Uh, I expect more studies to come on this topic very soon. Um, so um, this is just a generic calanoid copper pot. Um, it's very hard to identify just by these details. Um, in order to identify, you need to check uh, some of the legs and the cadre structure and require quite a lot of magnification. Here's some uh, mollusks, uh, the four main groups of, of, of mollusks. Um, from the more primitive, uh, the chitons here, where the shell is divided in, in the separate um, parts or, or valves, and they uh, live in close contact to add substrata, so they can, a little bit like limpets, they can just adhere to the surface and be protected from protection. But then when they start moving around this, um, the animals uh, lift from the from the bottom and this girdle uh, will appear, um, this is a soft part of the animals uh, to move around and underneath we have the gills and the mouse structures. Um, these uh, these are two representatives of gastropod, two different groups of gastropod, opistobranchs and prosobranchs. The different stays in the um, position of the internal structure and the characteristic of the um, mouthpieces called radula. And finally, representative of the bivalves with tyrosyra flex forces, which is uh, widespread all over the North uh, Sea. And here we have some echinoderms, probably my favorite groups, um, my favorite group, the um, starfish, we all know starfish. This is a tiny um, species, Sastrina gibosa. Uh, this is um, two to three millimeters. It doesn't get much bigger than this. Um, Strictly related to starfish are the brittle star, this is Anophyra halba, widespread all, all around the uh, British Isles. Um, they are in, a lot in common with um, starfish. Um, this is a oral view, so this is underneath the animal where the starfish, you, you can see it from the dorsal uh, view. Um, so the mouth is underneath them, they move with the mouth in contact with the um, seafloor so they can um, feed themselves and have the characteristic of this very elongate and serpent in shape um, arms, very fragile, hence the name Brita Star. Um, this is a representative of sea urchin, particular, uh, in particular this is a irregular sea urchin or sea potato commonly known, um, where the pentameric symmetry has uh, leave place to a more bilateral symmetry, although the pentameric uh, symmetry is still present in internal organs and in the petals here on top of the dorsal side. And finally, a sea cucumber where the uh, pentameric symmetry or bilateral symmetry is mostly gone, but it can still be seen by the distribution of the um, structure around the body and more important internally. I mentioned the other uh, group of miscellany where all the minor groups are included. They're not minor because they're smaller, they're minor because they are um, less present as an average in our sample, but still very much uh, present. 
Um, here's some example. This is a sipuncula, although it's wrong to be included in this slide because there's this uh, has been recently moved. Then Dicepungula filum has been moved to the polychaetes as some uh, internal kidney has been found uh, recently, well, more or less recently. Um, they are commercially important in some part of the world. They are uh, considered uh, prelibacy in Asian food, not this species, but others, of course. Um, this is a representative of uh, what is commonly known as moss animals, uh, bryozoans. Uh, this is an erect branching species, but most of them form like carpet covering uh, stones and are surface um, on the, uh, in, in the sea bottom. Um, and they are colonial. That's each one of these um, little white dots you can see is a single zoid. Uh, this is a colony of sponges belonging to the genus Leucosolina that form this quite intricate lattice. And finally, the um, infamous Nematostella vectensis, which is considered both invasive and protected species because it was originally found in a lagoon uh, environment, but it's not limited to lagoon environments. So there's uh, this duplicity um, role of being, of being invasive, but also being protected by Law. So what kind of my, really microscopic detail we're going to look to identify our, uh, our biota? Um, do you remember this? I showed you this a few um, slides ago and it's, the, it's a species I'm currently working on. is a Molpadia from the deep uh, ocean floor in the mid Atlantic. Uh, in order to properly identify this animal, we need to see the internal structure as well as uh, some details of the skin. Uh, this kind of geometrical shape structure you see are called spicula, which give the name to the um, to the class of the canoderms. That means spiky skin. And by the shape, distribution, and difference in the spicula, we are able to restrict and identify of. Uh, most of the sea cucumbers. Uh, peculiarity of the Molpadid family is that some of the spicule modify and becomes pigment all uh, across the uh, skin, these red patches. When we identify polychaetes, most of the times the details we need to look are the kitty, the bristle that emerge from the parapods, the other parapods in the worms, and we need to go really in deep details. Now the kitty can have a lot of different shapes and functions. These are just a couple of examples. This is a, a secret kitty that held together the parapod and uh, its axillary to the movements. Uh, with these are the called falciger and pseudospiniger skitty, for which we need to check sometimes the number of feet or the distribution and shape of the feet. So we need to go quite in deep details. Um, consider that this is, uh, the scale is 0.1 of a millimeter and this even high magnification. For the crustacean, although most of the time we can identify them using the general body shape and, and characteristics like spine and uh, some details on the um, legs. More often, especially for some kind of shrimp, we need to go in very deep details. This is a photo from a uh, scanning electronic microscope of the mantible of a Macrobrachium nipponesis, uh, uh, Asian um, Japanese uh, shrimp that um, can be identified just using the structure of the mandible. If then go in further details, we'll see that each of this cuspid is not a single structure, but is formed by a lot of bristles close together. It's a really fascinating uh, word, and I hope you enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks so much, Nicola. That was uh, absolutely fascinating. I'm, I'm from a freshwater background, so your journey into the marine environment was really uh, very interesting. I, I, I think maybe you've got the more interesting beasts there, but uh, I've always yeah, been I'm, a fan of, of the fresh water. I'm afraid I'm a little biased on the marine side. I'm sorry. <laughs> so um, we've 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 done a, an hour. Um, so some still people who are still with us, which will be which is great to see. I don't know if anyone has any questions. 
Um, you should be able to unmute yourself if anyone has any questions that they'd like to, to ask at this point. Okay. Well, I think uh, maybe you've been very comprehensive in your in your explanation, Nick. So uh, that's great. Um, so I'll just uh, finish by drawing your attention, please, to the, our next webinar, uh, which will be on um, the second of June, where we will be talking about hydromorphology in Ireland, issues and solutions. So again, something very relevant to. Uh, achievement and implementation of the River Basin Management Plan uh, and achievement of water framework directive requirements. So I look forward to seeing you or some of your colleagues then. We will send out notification of this nearer to the time. Um, and if you have any other questions that you didn't get to ask now or you have any interest in the kind of work that we can do on, on microscopic work for macroscopic projects, then please let us know. So with that, I'll say thank you very much. Uh, enjoy your day. Thanks again to Nick for your fantastic presentation. Thank you very much for everyone to attending and to you, Elliot. And any question, please let me know. Thank okay. you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.